Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror and detail. The realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First story. It followed me from Seattle. I hope it didn't follow me back. I'm still freaking the fuck out over what happened this last weekend. I think it's still out there. I fucking hope so. This all began a few months ago when I moved here from Wenatchee in eastern Washington to attend a university. I recently turned 21, but I didn't have any friends around to celebrate, so I did the next best thing. Rolled a blunt and watched some shit on Hulu. I'm really living the life here, I know. Undeclared major. Recreational weed. Living off my savings. And finally no more parents nagging at my door to do something with my life. Or at least so I thought. The first time I heard it, I thought it was paranoia. I smoke a ton of pot, and living in a new city doesn't help either. People say I live in the party area of downtown. Belltown, I think they call it. So far, it just seems like an endless parade of brothers and drug-addled street kids skulking at all times of the night, and to be honest, it doesn't really bother me that much. I drown that shit out with headphones, anyway. I much prefer it to that cold, deafening silence. The silence so strong you start realizing just how bad your tinnitus actually is. A silence that conjures nightmare creatures from the deepest reaches of your primitive mind to explain the occasional thud and thunk of a settling house. It was in that silence that I heard it. I was grinding some bud for my third bowl of the night when I noticed the empty quiet that filled the space outside of my apartment. I'm on the ground floor, so I'm basically used to all types of yelling, singing, arguing, and fighting when the sun goes down. But not now. Not tonight. There was nothing. Scratch. 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 It came from the window in my kitchen. It's in quotes because it's literally two burners and a mini fridge with a microwave on top. Despite what you know think about stoner stereotypes, I'm pretty fucking immaculate when it comes to cleaning too. That's why I was puzzled when I investigated the sound. Small amounts of dirt speckled across the small excuse for a counter under the window. The window was closed. I cleaned off the counter and figured I was too high to remember making that mess earlier. Fear was overcome by a wave of relaxation when I hit my pipe. Purple Kush. Family guy eased me into a coma, and by the morning I didn't even bother thinking about the noise from the night before. But from then on, it kept happening. Night after night after night. The same three. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Always at different times, too. 1 o'clock, 2.45. 1 3.40. There wasn't really a pattern to it just the same weird interval of nine scratches. It seemed to be getting faster every time. I just started assuming it was someone fucking with me. Maybe some guys picked a place to fuck with every night after they left the bar, and I got just happened to get lucky. This thought calmed me down, and I was eventually convinced that this was all it was. I still didn't have any friends here, and with the cold snap and rain, I didn't really feel like going out and making any yet. The school quarter was almost over, and I noticed that I wasn't getting enough sleep. The scratching was getting louder now, and joke or not, I had to get some rest before finals week. One of my classmates suggested going camping. She even offered to let me borrow her tent and sleeping bag. Supposedly, getting out of the city once in a while and being in nature helps calm the mind. Kinda hippie sounding, but I was stoned when she suggested it. I took up the offer and made a reservation at a campground near M.T. Rainier for this past weekend. I'd rather not say which one because it might still be there waiting for someone. The girl from my class met me at a Starbucks downtown and gave me her camping gear. 
I really appreciated the gesture, but I'm not sure if my high-as-fuck monotone voice and glossy red eyes conveyed any evidence of that. Didn't matter anyway. I packed a couple grams of bud, my pipe, and my old Nikon SLR. I got inspired by all the Milky Way pictures people post on the internet, and sleep or not, that was my mission now. The trip out to the park was long, 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 and boring. Saw maybe one gas station for 20 miles, and I may have eaten my snacks on the way there. I stopped there to re-up the trail mix and cliff bars and muscle milks before I continued on my way. The clerk looked Native American. Old, too. He had this weird look in his eyes when I approached him, as if he was about to say something, but cut himself off and silently rang up my tasty treats. It was his eyes, though, that bothered me. He had this look of sympathy and dread and sadness. All mold into one. Maybe I was analyzing the situation too hard, but it seemed like he wanted to tell me something. Whatever, though. I had a galaxy to photograph. The campsite was okay. I pitched the tent fast even though some of the poles were missing and didn't snap all the way. I took a hit off my pipe and looked up at the sky, SLR in hand ready to snap that award-winning Milky Way shot. Clouds. Nothing but a fucking gray sky. Too tired to drive. I got in the tent and listened to a podcast from my phone speakers. I don't remember when I fell asleep, but I did. Eventually. And then I woke up. Atch, scratch, scratch. Scratch, scratch, scratch. It was scratching on the fucking tent. Get the fuck off my tent, douchebags. And again, I was met with that cold silence. No one responded. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Scratch, scratch, scratch. I was somewhat paralyzed from fear, but in that brief moment I checked my phone to make sure I wasn't dreaming. I refreshed a news app and saw it update in real time. Kind of a dumb way to check that everything is okay, but I guess it doesn't matter WHE. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Scratch your way up. All around the tent, I heard it scratching and scratching to a point where I thought I was just going insane. My heart pounded out of my chest, and my anxiety was at the highest point it's ever been my entire life. Each passing moment of silence felt like another calm to a storm of terror. The scratching in my imagination. I couldn't get out of the tent. I couldn't speak. I waited. And waited. It continued, scratching faster and faster, and suddenly I heard something. Mm, mm, why, 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 why? Silence. Scratching. T in it. The way it spoke. Definitely not normal sounding for a person. The fact I was even questioning the humanity in its voice was reason enough to piss myself. Which I did. For a grown-ass man, I was on the verge of tears. This was too much. I grabbed my car keys and phone and weed and unzipped the front flap. I bolted to the car, not looking back as I ran. The keys fumbled around the lock and I could hear something behind me. Turning? It sounded huge, but it sounded like it was on two feet. The key slid in and that's when I remembered I had a clicker moment of dumb realization and that I was still relatively high. Got the ignition started, turned the high beams on, and reversed out of my spot to hightail it out of the campground. Nothing in front of me, but I checked behind. Perhaps reflexively, I peeked the rearview mirror before hitting the gas only to see too long. Hair-covered legs, illuminated by my brake taillights, making giant strides toward my rear window. I stomped on the pedal. Whatever it was tried to catch up to me, but it gave up after I approached about 60 miles per hour. The drive back was a relief, and a part of me still could not believe what happened. When I got home, it was already morning. The sun was up, and I could see people staggering back from bars and nightclubs. It was a small moment of relief. I felt a little back to normal. 
until I got out of the car to get the supplies. Huge gashes were scratched into the window and door, and my tailpipe was slightly bent. At least I'm not crazy, I thought. I lifted up the rear hatch and forgot that I abandoned that girl's camping gear out near M.T. Rainier. My stomach dropped. There's no way she would believe my story. But that's when I noticed something else in the back seat of my car. Dirt. Small amounts of it speckled across the floor and seats. Update 4.53 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's back. Second story. The Wendigo is near. This is a story which happened to me and my friend a few years back. I work in a national park as a park ranger. When my life was relatively normal, I had just landed a job at a national park. Life was good as I was working with my buddy Rob. The second day was strange. We found bear traps on the ground. We never put them there. Other than that, another day in paradise. But throughout the night, I swear I heard a loud screech coming from the woods near my watchtower. I looked and saw nothing. I just shrugged it off after a little while. As of lately, we have been finding small animal corpses around the woods. This is normal since we have bears all over. It's just that these marks were too big to belong to a bear. What's even weirder is we found a tooth inside of a bloody deer. This tooth was too huge and sharp to belong to a bear. I think we have a new animal in these woods. Today we found a bear, hanging from a tree and gutted. I nearly threw up. No animal in the park could do this. Boss told us from now on to stay at the watchtowers. I kept being reassured that everything would be fine, but at this point I just couldn't be too sure anymore. Lately the screeches have been more frequent. I'm having trouble focusing. When I was younger, I was told of a creature that fed off people and animals. It could also mimic voices. It was called a wendigo. Of course I don't believe in that paranormal crap, but something was taking out animals throughout the park. I swear I heard Rob call me from outside of my watchtower. He yelled, Hey Trent, you have got to come see this. I nearly left, but I just felt that his voice was off, nearly distorted. I looked out of my watchtower to see Rob, his insides dangling in the breeze. My boss ruled this out as an accident that still didn't stop the police from questioning me. I know I heard his voice. I saw something in the woods. Let me explain. This creature I saw had huge antlers, an animal skull as a mask, and it was over 11 feet tall. The night began normally, until the screeches began again. I looked down, only to see this creature, eating my boss's lifeless body. I got a good look at it before it ran off and out of sight. The police have been very suspicious of me lately. How could they not be? Both of the people I worked with are dead. I tried to explain what I saw to the police. Of course nobody believed me. It all led to me being terminated. I've decided I'm not going to let this creature ruin my life. I have done research on this Wendigo. I plan to break into the park tonight. I will end this, I must. I'm in the park. I hear the screeches and I am following them. I hear the voices of my boss and Rob. They are telling me that they are okay and I should come meet them by my watchtower. I know from my research that the Wendigo creature is really good at tricking people. I just kept wandering around the park. I was wondering until I heard my mother's voice. She died when I was six. My instincts told me no but I had missed her so much. Don't worry, Mom. I'm coming. Third story. Sinister beings in the Oklahoma forests. I'm so excited to see Mom. My daughter exclaimed. I know you are, honey. Come on now. Get in the car. To give you all a little backstory, my name is Michael. My wife divorced me two years ago due to me having a crippling drug addiction. Over the course of these two years... I became a better person. I stopped taking drugs and hanging out with my old pals all in the hopes that my wife will come back to me one day. That day never came. One day, I got a call from my ex saying that my daughter missed me and really wanted to see me. After all, 
You can't keep a child from seeing their own father. I drove four hours to Springfield to pick her up and went back home. She stayed with me for two weeks. We went to the arcade, the movies, her favorite restaurant, and I even bought her a few dolls here and there. Anyways, the two weeks pass by quickly, and it's time to take her back to her mother. You sure you got everything you need? Sweetie, this'll be a long drive. Yes, Dad. Can we go now? Of course we can. I started my car and began driving. I lived in Oklahoma City, and my ex lived in Springfield, Missouri. It's a four-hour long drive that involves going through the Oklahoma Ancient Forest, which is where we encountered them. Hey, Dad, look. Buzz, 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 buzz. Oh, hey, your mother is calling. I picked up the phone and accepted the call. E. Hello, Michael. So how's Haley? Did she have fun? Yeah, she's all right. We went to movies, the arcade. I even bought her some new toys. Can I talk to her? Haley here. Your mother wants to talk to you. Hi, sweetie. Did you have F? Dad, watch out. Burak squaling bang. Hello? Hello? Haley? Michael? We crashed the car. I passed out. The last thing I heard was my ex's worried voice over the phone. I woke up in my house. I was arguing with Samantha. Please, Michael. Please. Go to rehab, Michael. You have to stop. Please. You have to stop for the sake of our little Haley. Please listen to me. I can't. I, I tried. Then I can't be with you, Michael. I, I want a divorce. No, Samantha. Baby, please. I'm trying, I. Dad. Dad. Dad, wake up. Dad. Wow, what happened? We crashed into an elk. Dad. Oh my God. Oh God. Haley. Haley, are you hurt? Sweetie? Only a little. Is the elk still alive? Yes, Dad. I think it's hurt. I grabbed my pistol out of the glove box and got out of the car. I saw the elk, covered in blood and barely breathing. Poor thing. Oh, you poor, dumb animal. Haley, close your eyes. Bang. Dad, why did you shoot it? To put it out of its misery. I moved the elk out of the road and got back in the car. I pressed the gas pedal, but the car didn't move. You gotta be kidding me. I went out of the car and popped the hood open. The engine seemed okay. As I was opening the car door, I heard tree branches rustling and something rapidly approaching me. Fearing for the worst, I turned around and aimed my pistol in the direction of the sound with my finger on the trigger. Suddenly, the noise stopped. I sighed a sigh of relief. Maybe it was just a wild animal? Amidst all the chaos, I didn't seem to notice that Haley didn't make a noise as all that happened. I turned around to find a broken windshield, and Haley nowhere to be found. Haley? Haley, where are you, sweetie? Haley? I took a flashlight and an extra round of ammunition out of the glove box. I put the magazine in my pocket, turned on the flashlight, and began frantically looking for my daughter. Eventually, I saw the beam from my flashlight hit something. Haley? I said in a distraught voice. Haley, I, is that you? I got no response. I decided to keep on walking to whatever the thing was until its appearance became more clear as I approached. It was a girl all right, but not Haley. She looked much older, maybe 15 or 16. She was wearing a dirty white hospital gown, and her flesh seemed to be rotting. When I got close enough to clearly see the side of her head, I knew that there was no way in hell that thing was human. I slowly turned around and tried to walk back, but it was too late. It let out an ear-piercing demonic screech that I cannot describe. As I heard it rapidly approaching me, I knew that running was no good. I aimed my gun and fired half the mag at it until it finally collapsed. Thoughts started rushing through my brain. Did these things take Haley? What if they killed her? She's probably shivering out of fear right now. 
As my brain was processing what just happened, I heard a loud scream coming from the forest. Aya ha! Haley! Oh my god, that's Haley! I ran as fast as I could in that direction. I ignored the pentagrams and wendigo skulls hung up on the trees and kept on running towards the direction of the noise, pistol in hand. Suddenly, the fog cleared. The light of the midnight moon shined through the forest. The joy I felt was soon replaced by dread as I saw strange beings around me. There were at least five of them. One seemed to look like a wendigo. The other had the body of a horse and the torso of a human. The only thing I could say about the third one was that he had a tall, slender humanoid body wore a maroon hoodie with a black cape and carried a strange object in his hand. The fourth one was a fat humanoid figure. In his hand was a rotting, half-eaten corpse of a cat. The fifth one was an old woman. She was tall. Very tall. She wore a black dress and had black paint under her eyes. As I stood in the middle of those creatures, I knew I was hopeless. There's no way the tin bullets I had left would take out those hideous things. I blinked and saw them all standing not five inches away from me. I started shivering thinking about how gruesome my death will be. They all started chanting something in some sort of language I could not describe. I felt hopeless until the old woman raised her hand, and I saw Haley. Haley! Dad! Dad! Help! Let U.S. go! What do you want from us? Why are you doing this to U.S.? <coughs> Let U.S. go! <coughs> The old woman grabbed Haley and gave her to the fat one. I saw my daughter screaming her lungs out as the thing bit off her limbs one by one. No. Leave her alone. Haley. <laughs> it sounded like the woman was laughing. Eventually, my daughter's corpse was dropped right in front of me. So you killed her. Now kill me. Kill me. <laughs> Kill me too. <laughs> they started to walk away. This was sent to me by an anonymous Reddit user on the 17th of May. I was scrolling through Reddit. Not a day later when I found a post saying the dead body of a man was found in the Oklahoma ancient forest. His death was determined to be suicide via gunshot to the head. Fourth story. I nearly escaped a Wendigo at the cost of both of my parents. I kept this story a secret my whole life, I'm 22 now. This happened more than a decade ago, and I still have clear and vivid memories of this day. I miss my parents so much and wish I never did what I did that afternoon. I had a nice family. I had a mom, a dad, and a sister, but yet my parents are the ones I miss most. We all lived in a nice cozy cabin in Alaska, United States, near a dense and long-stretched forest. Usually my parents would take walks just to admire the beautiful snow and cold weather. My dad was a lumberjack and my mom was a normal housewife. We had such a perfect life before the incident happened. One morning I woke up to my sister yelling at my parents because she hated living here. I gave her the benefit of the doubt because she was 19 years old and had her own car but no friends due to us being isolated for miles. This argument went on for 20 minutes before I heard a door shut very loudly. I rushed downstairs to see what happened and my mom was crying because my sister had left our family to move more in the city in a different state. My dad still had to hear this news due to him, still cutting trees into smaller pieces out back. I rushed outside and I saw my sister. She wasn't actually going to the car, but instead going into the forest. I knew it. My kind sister would never leave us. I decided to follow her and see what she was up to. I quickly put on my jacket, boots, gloves, and snow pants and went into the forest. As soon as I went outside, I realized only one car was in in front of our house. It seemed weird, but I just thought Dad had to run to the store and do a few errands. So I ran towards where I last saw my sister. 
Once I was inside the forest, I realized it stretched longer than I thought it would, and weirdly enough there was a path I leading straight. I thought my dad cut these trees due to me being little and not really knowing much about lumberjacks. I went on, and when I turned back I could still see the house. I knew I would be safe, I would just plead with my sister not to leave, and everything would be alright. I wish it was that easy. I walked for what seemed like forever when I heard a familiar voice. My sister. I thought and started running towards that voice, but came to a stop. In front of my were long, white, and clean bones shaped like an old Native American roof. There was one thing that stood out with those bones. My sister's pink and gold necklace which had her name on it. I read it and it was her name. Now I was getting scared I turned around to see my house nowhere. I was lost. I shouted mom dad but nobody came. I ran in what seemed like a loop for five minutes when I heard footsteps. The footsteps seemed like that of a large creature. I ducked behind a log that had fallen and hid to not show myself. I peeked through holes in the log and saw it. This creature it was black head to toe, had blood dripping down its half-torn face. It had large bulging, almost human-like eyes. It was standing upright it looked almost seven feet. The scariest thing was I could see the creature's ribs, heart, and what looked like lungs still beating and perfectly in sync. I almost screamed at the sight of its nails. They were long and had points on them. The creature looked around, and when I blinked it wasn't there. Weird I thought, maybe I'm just imaging weird things. I tried to laugh it off, but the thought stayed at the back of my head. I had enough, and decided to run backwards again. This went on for another five minutes when I heard my mom's voice. I ran towards it, and it was near the bones I saw earlier. But the closer I got the more it seemed stranger. Mom's voice was usually kind and soft as well as comforting. But the voice I was hearing sounded demanding and slow. The closer I got the more I saw my cabin and I then started running towards it when the creature I saw earlier rose up on its legs, or what seemed like legs. It was taller when I was face to face with it, its eyes staring into my soul and I thought I was going to die. With lighting speed the creature ran towards me and I blacked out. I woke up. I was alive in my bed and my sister was here too. I thought it was just a dream but noticed she was crying. She was crying in a demonic tone. I got scared and pushed back against my bed. My sister turned around and I saw her eyes ripped out of her sockets as well as blood all around the house. I passed out again. This time I woke up in the forest. I felt immense pain near my arm and realized my left arm was bitten off. I saw it. The creature. He was eating my arm. He noticed I was awake and just stared as I screamed for help. I heard a familiar voice once again. It sounded like my dad. But where was it coming from the more blood, I lost the closer the voice got, and the more the creature started getting aggravated. I thought I was going to die but saw both my parents. This made me flash back into reality, and I realized I was going to have to scream in order for me to be alive. I screamed at the top of my lungs the creature stood on its legs and threw my arm away. He walked towards me and planned on killing me right then and there. I started crying with the last bit of energy I had left and I saw them. My dad and my mom. They were here. I then noticed dad was terrified and was backing away when he saw this creature. Mom threw rocks at it and the creature ran into the forest. My parents picked me up. I was happy to see them the last thing I saw before I blacked out was my mom behind my dad getting ripped to shreds by that thing. Fifth Story Somewhere in the Canadian wilderness, there's a highway with no exits. Oh, I'm heading through the valley, where the lone road has no end. Grizzly bear and mule deer greet me. Trapper, hunter ain't my friend. Take a sip, poor weary traveler. Don't join in, don't rest your head. Turn yourself back to your trail now. Ravens talk, don't be misled. 
I can't help but miss my darling, in this lonely place I roam. But the elk and lynx console me, big horned sheep will lead me home. I sang my grandfather's old campfire tune as my Subaru cruised along the Tulane Highway. There was no FM radio reception this far out into the mountains, so my choices were to sing or enjoy the silence. This song, in particular, felt appropriate. It had been two hours since the road had dipped into this valley, and I couldn't recall seeing an exit since then, even a small dirt road or campground turnoff. My fuel light flicked on. Shit. This was weird. Even if I had taken a wrong turn, I should have seen something by now. I hazarded a glance at my phone. No reception, so no roadside assistance. I also couldn't remember the last time I passed another car. So if I ran out of fuel here, I would be stranded, for who knows how long star dot asterisk. At an eighth of a tank, I began to panic. Twenty minutes later, my engine sputtered and died. I rolled to a stop on the shoulder. Still no reception. My stomach clenched. You're okay, Abby. This will be fine. Just breathe. The scenery here looked exactly like it had for the last 300 kilometers. Evergreen forest grew in every direction, separated from the road on both sides by a 30-meter stretch of grass. The sun peeked over the trees. It would be setting soon. Somewhere, a raven crowed. The emergency kit. That was a good idea. I reached into my back seat and pulled out a large black plastic toolbox. It held a flashlight, water bottle, energy bars, blanket, camp knife, and some other essentials. I opened it up and placed it in the passenger seat. As the sun pulled below the trees, a flash of movement in the tree lean caught my eyes. Half curious and half concerned, I pulled out my flashlight and pointed it towards what I'd seen. Nothing. Unsettled, I continued to slowly scan the tree lean. I caught something. It looked like a deer's head, poking out of the trees. What the fuck? As my light hit it, it disappeared. Not like the deer had turned around, but like something had yanked the head backwards. I slammed the lock button on my doors and crumpled downwards into my seat. Shit, 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 shit. It was just a deer. Just a deer. Just a deer. My heart slammed relentlessly against my chest. I took a deep breath, then three more. I slowly rose back upright and pointed my flashlight towards the trees. I flicked it on. I caught something again. Deer heads. Three this time. Except they weren't heads. They were skulls. Fuck no. I swapped my flashlight into my left hand and retrieved my camp knife with my right. I began to scan both sides of the tree lean, praying that I just had some sort of hallucination. As time passed, that started to seem likely. I saw nothing for twenty minutes, then an hour. Dear skulls? I'm going crazy. My heart began to settle. At some point, I drifted off. Bang 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 bang. A skull pressed against the passenger window. Another on the driver's side. Another in front of the car. I screamed. A skull slammed into the window beside me. I screamed. The car handles rattled. I screamed. Another slam. A hairline fracture formed in the glass. I choked. There were five things pressed up against my car. They stood on two legs and looked almost human but with deer skulls where their heads should have been. They carried spears and bows, and wore hide tunics. I caught movement behind them. More were lurking near the trees. One of the things let out a sound. It was almost a voice, but strained and unnatural, like someone trying to speak while inhaling. HHHB. The others joined in. HHHB. Suddenly, in a voice exactly like my grandfather's, perfectly calm. Get out of the car, Abby. I screamed. I'll kill you. Leave me the fuck alone. I'll kill you. I fumbled around below my seat and retrieved the camp knife from where it had fallen. 
I held it out with shaking hands. The window shattered. A hand reached through and clutched the handle. I thrust forward, burying the knife in the thing's forearm. It pulled the arm back, taking the knife with it. I held on for dear life. The other hand darted forward, grabbing my wrist. It squeezed immediately. My hand went numb. It yanked the knife away, and my limp fingers surrendered it. I backed myself up, trying to slide into the back seat, kicking out desperately with my legs. The car door swung open. Tears streamed down my cheeks. Please eat in twantity eat in twantity eat in twantity. Ignoring my pleas, it grabbed my left ankle and yanked. My head struck the car seat, then the door, then the ground. My vision spun. My hands desperately scrambled for purchase as my body dragged across the dirt and rocks. I bucked, trying to free my foot and get upright. I kicked the thing with my other leg. It didn't even react. I thrashed and shrieked at the top of my lungs. The world faded. I caught glimpses, pockets of consciousness. The deer-headed things all around me. Trees. A worm-ridden corpse hanging from a noose. I awoke in a daze and tried to get my bearings. I was in a ten-foot clearing, in the middle of dense forest. At the center of the clearing was a dining table, with chairs arranged around it. I was seated at the foot. The rest of the places were occupied by the skull-headed things. All of them were quiet, turned in my direction. No animal noises, no sounds of wind whistling through the trees. No ambient sound of any sort pierced the silence in the clearing. There was only me and these creatures from hell. The table was set for each of us. In front of me was a goblet of black liquid and a plate of unsightly meat. As I looked around, one of them spoke in the same unsettling voice as before. Drink, eat, sleep. I shook my head. Have a sip. You must. Something about those words was familiar. Take a sip, poor weary traveler. The song echoed through my head. It reminded me of my grandfather. Of nights spent around a campfire in the backyard, singing songs and roasting marshmallows. I would give anything to be back there. Anything to be anywhere else. As I continued through the verses in my head, an uncanny realization swept over me. The valley. An endless road. Things that mimic human speech, like ravens. They're hunters. Trappers. A glimmer of hope in the darkness. It might be a coincidence, but I'd take it over nothing at all. So that means... I took a sip of the black liquid. It scorched my tongue, and I stifled a gag. At this... The hunters took massive swigs from their goblets. They broke out into strange chatter. It sounded like a mixture of different animal calls, all blended together into something singular and bizarre. They weren't looking at me anymore. Don't join in. Don't rest your head. As quietly as possible, I lifted out of my chair and slunk towards the tree lean. They didn't seem to notice, or if they did... They were too busy to stop me. I broke out into a run. As I hurtled through the trees, I kept my eyes peeled. The song mentioned trappers too. I could barely see in the darkness, but managed to narrowly avoid a net strung up between two trees and just barely noticed a tripwire lying across the forest floor. I ran and ran and ran. Nothing seemed to change and I had no sense of direction. For all I knew, I could have been running in circles. Once I couldn't run anymore, I alternated between walking and jogging. After about an hour, I started hearing voices. Every minute or two, coming from somewhere in the distance. All sorts of perfectly normal voices, some of which were familiar. Abby, where are you? My best friend. Mom? Are you out there? Can you talk to us? This is Banff Search and Rescue. A man. Please help me. I'm caught in the net. They're going to kill me. Please help me. 
a child. Raven's talk, don't be misled. It barely needed to be said. I continued onwards. After another twenty minutes, I started to hear movement behind me, a long ways off, but getting closer and moving in my direction. I picked up speed and turned twenty degrees to the left. Two minutes later, the sounds turned as well. They were on my trail. I was out of energy and out of options, in the middle of nowhere. Did I really think I could get away? I felt the little sliver of hope in my chest flicker, but it wasn't dead yet. All I could do was keep running, and I could do that. For half an hour, I managed to stay ahead of my pursuers. I wasn't moving very quickly, but neither were they. Following my trail must have been difficult. As lightheadedness started to set in, I spotted another trap ahead. This one was different. It had caught something. It was a net, hoisted a foot off the ground, and inside was an animal, desperately thrashing around. Poor thing. I'd been running for my life for hours, but something about that trapped animal broke my heart. I know the feeling, little guy. I sighed. I had two seconds until I reached the trap, two seconds to make a choice. All right, let's do the stupid thing. I was doomed either way. At least this animal could get away if I stopped to help it, even if that allowed my pursuers to catch me faster. I reached the net, then crouched down, sized it up for a moment, and pulled the fastening knot apart. The creature bucked and came free. It was a sheep with two large horns. Big horned sheep will lead me home. The sounds of the hunters drew closer, almost within a stone's throw. The sheep took off, and I followed. A dawn glow started to fill the forest. The sheep bounded through the trees. I desperately pushed through the underbrush, hopping across streams and over stones, trying not to fall behind. My foot slipped on a stepping stone, and I tumbled to the ground. I hastily struggled to my feet, then slipped again. I stumbled forward another step, and my legs gave out from under me. My overspent body was finally shutting down. The sheep was surely long gone by now. I'd lost my chance, just when there was finally a glimmer of hope. I screamed in frustration and despair, and tears welled up in my eyes. My body refused to move. I curled up and waited for death. I felt something wet on my forehead and looked up in shock. The sheep was standing over me, licking the sweat and blood from my face. I smiled in appreciation for a moment. Then, with dread, I turned to look behind me. As I feared, the hunters were barely twenty feet away. They had stopped in a semicircle around us. They brandished their spears and bows, and their skulls screeched and hissed menacingly. Calmly and deliberately, the sheep stepped in front of me, placing himself between me and my pursuers. It was just a small creature, not more than four feet tall. But as it stood there defiantly, I couldn't help but feel safe. The hunters looked jittery now, glancing back and forth between one another. What's stopping them? Are they afraid of the sheep? The sheep turned his head back and forth slowly, looking at each of the hunters in turn. He stomped his feet. At the same moment, they hissed and screamed like wounded cats and fled in the direction they came from. I pulled myself to my feet, steadying myself against a tree trunk. The sheep proceeded slowly now, and I limped onwards behind him. Eventually, the trees began to clear, and he stopped. I crouched down next to him. Is this as far as you go? The raspy voice that escaped my lips barely sounded like my own. He bucked his head up and down slightly. Not sure whether it was appropriate, I pulled him into a hug. I started to cry again. Thank you, I whispered. He leaned his head into my neck for a moment, then we pulled apart and he plodded off back into the trees. The more I think about that night, the more I conclude that I found the favor of something ancient and powerful that day. 
something that could have easily freed itself from that trap if it wished to. I continued to the edge of the forest, and I found myself back on the highway. I heard the sound of a vehicle and turned around. A pickup truck was coming down the road in my direction. I waved my arms over my head, and it began to slow down, then pulled to the shoulder alongside me. Howdy! shouted the burly, bearded man who stepped out. You drive an Impreza? I nodded, too tired to speak or think. Happened to cross your car a bit down the way. I got an extra jerry can if you just need gas. I nodded again. You want to ride back there? I get if that ain't comfortable. So whatever you think. I nodded a third time. As we pulled away, I found myself drifting off. As my consciousness slipped away, the driver began to sing quietly. Oh, I'm heading through the valley, where the lone road has no end. So there you have it. I made it back to my car. The highway where my car was parked looked nothing like the endless highway I was stranded on. Slept in the back for a while, then continued on my way. If there's a takeaway here, it's this. Pass on the old campfire songs you hear. They could save lives. Six Story Unidentifiable ten-foot-tall creature spotted in Lebanon, Maine. My sister and I were driving to a haunted walk in Lebanon, Maine called Destination Haunt, and while in the town trying to find the place we drove onto this really old dirt road called Lord Road from the East. At the time we turned onto the road it was day and the sun was out. As soon as we started driving down the sky, turned near black like night, as if the sun was setting and a fog engulfed the road. We quickly started joking about how this is like one of those wrong turn roads in those horror movies where a group of kids get lost in the woods and never leave. It added to the effect when we drove over an old wooden bridge suspended over a river. My sister acknowledged the narrowness of the road and asked how two cars could fit traveling in opposite directions. I joked, well no one ever leaves this place. In Maine all you see are fields of trees for hundreds of miles at a time. But the trees on this road looked unusually different. They were all collectively old and had the colors sucked out of them. Their branches and bases curved in usually zigzag patterns unlike conventional trees that grow in a pattern to get the most sunlight. I drove a few miles until I had enough of the massive puddles and decided to call the place we were trying to find. They told me that their location was miles away on the west side of this road and to turn back because the east side was flooded and we should enter the west end entrance located on the other side of town instead. We turned around and saw a moose walking across the road, very normal in Maine, but right behind it was a ten-foot-tall black as can be two-legged and unnaturally slim creature running unnaturally fast across the road. My sister screamed. It looked like Slender Man. Only it had huge black jagged horns and had no apparent bodily features or shape to it. It looked like a 2D cut out of an unnatural human. When we drove by where he ran we looked into the woods and saw it standing on two legs next to the moose. It leaned over in a hunchback manner and started walking around on all limbs and there were others just like it emerging from the mist. We drove the hell out of there hoping my engine wouldn't seize from the huge ass puddles. But on our way back we saw two abandoned buildings with old cars from the 50s and 60s that rotted into the earth. Those houses were not there before when we originally drove down. The creepiest part was when we got back to the main road because the sun was almost set and the sky almost pitch black. When we pulled out of the road the sun reappeared. The sky readjusted today as if nothing ever happened. Later that night I looked at Google Maps and the road was completely different on there. Filled with things that wasn't there when we driving and all the houses looked new. After telling a few people about it someone told me that Lebanon, Maine is known to have a lot of strange paranormal stuff happen and that there is even a self-proclaimed witch fortune teller who lives there. Has anyone here experienced something like this? Seventh Story The Wendigo I am a fan of horror games. I don't play them but I love watching my favorite YouTubers play them. In fact, 
My favorite YouTuber who used to play horror games is H2O Delirious. One of my favorite game that he played is Until Dawn. I love it because it deals with a cultural monster, the Wendigo. The Wendigo is a monster who craves for human flesh. Wendigos were once human, but because they started to eat human flesh, they turned into Wendigos. Wendigos are able to imitate other people's voices to trick their prey. Wendigos are able to hear heartbeats from miles away. They are also really fast. I am starting to go off topic do here is my story. I had my own experience with the Wendigo. I live in a small town near the forest. I won't reveal where the place is because I am still afraid that it is still there. A friend and I, a female girl that is a year younger than me, decided to walk in the forest by ourselves. There aren't any dangers in the forest since we were still close to town. We stumbled upon a two-story, worn-down cabin while walk near the outskirts of town. Most of the second story was non-existent. It seemed strange that it was still up and no one torn it down. Before I was born the people of this town torn down all buildings in the forest for reasons unknown. I tried asking my parents but their response is that it was very difficult to aid people who lived in the forest. Anyway, my friend and I got very curious and decided to check it out. We were quiet upon entering the cabin which now that I am looking back at it. I am very thankful that we were quiet. At the time we were quiet in case there was a homeless man sleeping or a dangerous person in there. It was still daytime when we were exploring so we had plenty of light in the cabin, but there was one part of the cabin that was covered up. There was a black tarp that covered a doorway to some room. We never went near the doorway. We were both scared that we would get jumped by someone. My friend and I both agreed to stay clear of that area. Throughout the exploring we both noticed that there was a faint disgusting smell. The smell lingered only on the first floor. I though the reason is because since the second floor is open, the wind would blown off the smell away. Plus there must have been dead animals beneath the floorboards or something. It was only when we got near the, the closed off room did everything went downhill. Both my friend and I started to get a bit louder since we did not hear anybody in the building. When we got near the hallway of the room, the smell got drastically stronger. Then we both noticed that the tarp had moved ajar. The room was still too dark, but I could have sworn that there were a pile of bones. I noticed that my friend gotten slightly scared because neither one of us had gone eight feet near the room. My first though was that someone was living here and that we should get out quietly in case the person was dangerous. I signaled my friend to be quiet and to follow me towards the back exit. As we were about to leave, we heard a familiar voice. I looked at my friend and I could see in her face confusion. Then it spoke again. It was calling for help. We both continued to stand near our exit, frozen in shock. Who could it be? Why would anybody need help in this place? We explored this cabin, and we know the area. You could hardly get hurt around here. I got rid of my shock and slowly I went near the shouts. My friend upon realizing that I was making my way towards the shouts pulled me back. She told me that it might be a trap and that I should not go any nearer to the person. She also said that the voice seems off. She does not understand why but she knows that there is something off about the screams. No later when she said that, we heard some other people shout if the mysterious screaming person was okay. Quick movements were heard somewhere in the cabin. Fear struck us both, and we slowly walked backwards to the door. The movements that we heard seemed inhuman. The sound we heard is like the sound of the wind of a jump rope makes when going really fast. Not only that but after the event, when my friend got the courage to speak about this event, she said that she saw a blur move across the room near where, maybe, the other people were at. By the time we were at the door, the other people came. They were two unfortunate men. They both looked around before seeing us. Are you two okay? One of them asked. We gave no response. We were still afraid what was in the house. 
one step forward towards us, was enough. Are you dash she got cut off? The thing that was lurking in the shadows came out. It attacked the man. The thing was bony and the skin was pale and rotten. It looked human, but it clearly wasn't. The ting ripped the head of the poor man. We did not see the rest of it for we booked out of the cabin and ran as fast as we could. All we heard a scream, but as soon as we heard it, it was cut off. Then there was another one. But this one was inhuman. We both did not stop until we reached the town. We never spoke to this event to anybody. Not even when people have asked us if we were okay since we both looked pale and out of breath. Be careful out there in the woods. You never know what might happen. May the Lord save you if you come across one of them. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end. Subscribe to our channel Horror in Detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comments section. And like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.